Ah, hi there, and welcome back in. It's the Friday edition of the Bet US TV College Basketball Show. I am the somewhat capable host, TJ Reeves. Handicappers back aboard. Kyle Hunter, good to be back with you for a second consecutive day. Corby Craig makes another appearance for this week, and we are ready to go. Look, we'll be honest with the audience, not exactly a stellar Friday slate. There are some games. There are going to be some official plays, but my Lord, as we uh, wrap up February, tremendous Saturday, and even we'll sneak a little Sunday uh, look ahead on what some lines might be and some thoughts on some games. And of course, your questions and comments are upcoming live with us as well uh, here this afternoon. Thank you for finding us, however you've done so. Uh, Kyle Hunter, uh, you're back aboard here. We took a look at some of uh, the action yesterday, you went one and one. I did catch some of that UTEP game with Louisiana Tech. I thought you were going to be good. It's just, just shoulda, coulda, woulda until Louisiana Tech pulled it out. Yeah, UTEP uh, there plus the three. Uh, the, the hold your nose game, uh, Fullerton and Cal Poly did stay under. All right, so what are your thoughts on Thursday, including a, a late night Washington State upset at Arizona? What are your thoughts, my friend? Uh, I thought UTEP was going to be good. That was a really tight game back and forth. UTEP had a little bit of a lead there at half, but uh, La Tech pulled away just at the end. The Cal Poly game, I promise I did not watch any of that game. I did check the score. Um, <laughs> you know, Even for somebody like me, that was too much. And um, Washington State, Arizona, I did watch the entire game of that. Fantastic game. Kyle Smith mm -hmm. is an amazing coach. Uh, I think he has to be coach of the year at this point. I don't know who would be in front of him. And Arizona, I mean, I think Arizona is still a very good team, but I think that was more about Washington State being better. Um, and, uh, I mean, they're going to jump in the rankings pretty far. And with the Purdue loss last Sunday, starting with that, the UConn loss midweek, and now Arizona losing, and Arizona's the only one of the three that lost at home, you start asking the question, does anybody want to lock up the number one seed uh, right now on the one seed line? Corby Craig, good morning. Good to see you. Thoughts on Thursday and getting ready for the weekend as well. How are things? Yeah, it's good. It seems like I always have my bad beats when I'm not on the show, so I uh, can't complain too much. Had a game last night. I uh, cannot even remember. It was you know, one of the crappy games I bet on. Um, I, don't, I actually don't even remember who it was. Oh, it was uh, Sacramento State. Sacramento State uh, needed the the hook to win. I had uh, 129 and a half, 129, 13 seconds left. Just decide, you know what? We lose. Let's not foul. They didn't foul. It seems like uh, if you had an under there, it's definitely they're definitely going to foul. They don't, they don't in that situation. But yeah, I think Arizona a weak team, uh, a, a Saturday slate that's going to be insane. So we have a, a lot to talk about on this Friday. By, by the way, Jeff Nadu put this stat out, and Kyle, we were talking about Ohio State at Minnesota. M am I correct now? Minnesota 23-3 and three against the spread as they covered last night, and they had that thing covered easily in the final three or four minutes. Uh, and then I, I had it on, and they kept fouling Ohio State while up by like double figures or up by nine. And, I, and the middle school basketball coach in me is coming out, Kyle, going, what are you doing? Stop fouling them and giving them opportunities to set their defense and at the free throw line. And But anyway, Minnesota covered again. That amazing role continues, Kyle, in the uh, the Big Ten. Just keep an eye on it for the Gophers. Yes, TJ, and, and both of you guys know I'm a Buckeyes fan. I tried to go with the Buckeyes hat yesterday to see if that would work. The hat trend had been good, but it does not work on Ohio State or else it does not work against Minnesota. 23-3 and three against the spread. Fantastic stuff. There's another really good coaching job that's been done this year. And by the way, is he being subliminal with something about Kentucky? Find out later on in the show. All right, let's take a look at uh, at officially what we had. Jeff Nadu did get home, by the way, with the Vermont play, even though it was minus nine. He went ahead and played it, went one and one yesterday. So a two and two day on the show. You see that we are still above 500 here, headed to the end of February. Be appreciative of that, savages. Uh, right now you're getting some good advice. And with that, let's get to that good advice on Friday. And then we'll talk some about the weekend as well. Uh, Corby Craig loves him some Ivy League Fridays. Here we go. Columbia and Brown. Columbia laying three and a half. Total 147 in this matchup that is coming this evening. Okay, what drew you to this game first? You had a, you had a pick of a couple of different Ivy League games that you could have uh, chosen. But Corby, what drew you to Brown and Columbia tonight? 
yeah, this is an interesting game. Uh, Ivy League, always fun. Always a scheme-based handicap. And, and this isn't going to be as long as the conversations I usually have. I don't have any cool like information. <laughs> Simply put, <laughs> these two teams played a few weeks back. I think it was like early February. February 10th, to be exact. Columbia beat the brakes off of them. I bet Brown minus four. Um, and, and you see now the line is completely flipped to Columbia for basically. Then this is too much of a move. Uh, in, in short, that Columbia game was kind of a a one-off. It was played at 11 a.m. First off, uh, Brown has the more excruciating offense to run. Like So they just looked like they didn't care to be there. And if you watch Columbia in the first half, it was all just miscommunication defense, backdoor layups the entire game. So I think this game is as close to a pick as you can be. I think these two teams are equally as talented. I actually would give the talent edge to Brown. Uh, I just think that in the last matchup, Brown really wasn't there. Like uh, you saw a Columbia team that was getting literally layups. I I, I see they shot uh, 64% from two. So uh, I don't think they were hitting hard shots at all. And uh, you just see a Columbia team that was able to walk through at moments notice. Like, let's say this game is close. They won 63-69. Let's say this game is close. Where does this line open up? I think it opens up closer to like Brown 1 or or pick. So by all means, give me the 3.5. Take the dog here. Uh, Brown, I think we got 3.5 for the sake of the show. Uh, interesting. I don't know if the Ivy League had like a midterm exam, you know, winter break situation, whatever. But they didn't play a lot of games last weekend. But they're back playing now for this weekend anything here kyle on brown and columbia as uh, corby mentioned they do have a recent meeting both of them kind of middling in the ivy league columbia and uh brown here brown three and six columbia four and five anything kyle yeah um you know as somebody in the chat says abdur rahim coach of the year definitely he's one of the others that could be coach of the year as well um you know I, I'm never too excited to talk Ivy League. Corby, definitely more of an Ivy League guy than I am. Um, I will say for this one, I kind of think the under could be a decent play. The first game only had 64 possessions. Some really bad defense played in that one. I think this total is a little bit high. Joe in the chat was asking about the under as well. Um, you know, the first game was 83-69. Shot quality believes it should have been 66-65. So, um, you know, that that's a help there as well. And regarding the side, um, Brown's been pretty unlucky. If you look at a lot of the luck factor stats, as long as they care to keep fighting because they haven't had a great season, uh, as long as they care here in this one, I think they're probably the right side. So uh, we will see. I, I think I would bet the under as my first play in this game, though. Corby Craig, however, does have a side. And he says when Brown and Columbia get together, throw the records out and take Brown plus the three and a half in a rematch situation this evening at 7 Eastern time uh, in the Ivy League. All right, we move on to two more games that are in the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference for Friday. Then we get to some Saturday discussion, your questions, and more. Iona and Ryder are playing tonight in the MAAC. This is a pick game with a uh, total of 145 for this matchup. Again, these are a couple middle-of-the-pack teams. Ryder is 8-6. and six. I'm sorry, Ryder is uh, seven and six. Iona is eight and six. All right, Corby Craig, you're back again uh, for an official play on this. What drew you to this game for play number two? Yeah, the last game, Brown was kind of an eyeball, simple handicap. You know, uh, I think that these two teams are even, but that's not the case here. This one is an information bet. Um, basically, when you watch these like low-level college basketball teams that we're watching, uh, I think that things just slip through the cracks a lot. So Iona's best player, Greg Gordon, uh, left the team. He's going to join the transfer portal. That was announced last night at 6 p.m. Uh, the thing is, these lines have openers. So like at 2 p.m., you could bet the under here at 146. Then Greg Gordon, who is our leading scorer and leading rebounder, a decent defender, but more often than not forces the issue on offense, is announced out. And yet the number doesn't move at all. I, I think this is just a case in point where like these major market the people that are steaming these numbers don't really pay attention to Iona's best player leaving the team. So uh, without Greg Gordon, I think this number is way closer to like a 141. Uh, I bet the under here, 145. Also, Worth noting that when Greg Gordon hasn't played, like it, he played one game of 10 minutes, I think it was 11 minutes, um, and, and sat, and then he played, he has one game this year where he didn't play. The game he didn't play, they scored 61 points versus St. Francis. The game he played 11 minutes, they scored 57 versus St. Peter's. So this is an offense that has run 
almost entirely through him. He has given them second chance, third chance opportunities. Uh, and without him, I don't really know how they score. Uh, but more important, if you take any major piece out of a team, the numbers should eventually move, and this one didn't. So uh, I would take an under 145. Uh, interesting um, that it didn't move very much, and you're and you're pointing that out. I was just thinking when you were saying this, and I'm not beating you up. I'm not bringing it up as a sore subject, but it's a comparison. Penn State kicked their best player off the team, their leading scorer, Clary, before the Illinois game, and it didn't matter. Now you can you can talk about different variables, like they fed off the the rec hall on campus gymnasium. They had the whiteout going with all the fans in the white shirts, but they they put together a tremendous night in the second half and offensively without one of their best scores. So there's a reference point that it has already happened this week as well in the Big Ten, Corby. So, again, you're thinking that it could happen in this game. Kyle, any thought here? Iona and Ryder total right around 145 and a half. Any thought on the total on this one tonight at 7 Eastern? Well, um, Gordon had 28 points in the first matchup between these two, too. So that's uh, he's obviously really key. He had like six offensive rebounds in that game. Uh I think Ryder is probably the side I'd want in this game. And I would have said that even before Gordon, but now hearing that news, which is awesome that uh, Corby has that uh, kind of information. Um, you know, I think Ryder is the high upside team of these two. This was the preseason favorite in this conference. And um, they have actually played pretty well lately. Uh, 104 62 win. I know it's Manhattan, but on the road, uh, you go on the road, win 104 62. You've done something pretty well. Um, this has been a rider team that's been back and forth, very inconsistent. The first game between these two was a uh, one-point game uh, where Ryder came back late. I think Ryder is in a pretty good spot in this game. As far as the total, I would lean under as well uh, based on that news. And the first game really made no sense. They, they played extremely fast. Uh, Iona got a big lead. Ryder had to play fast to try to come back. So uh, that kind of skews things. That's Ryder's fastest game by like – five possessions in any of their last 10 games. So I don't think they'll play that fast again. And uh, without a star player there for Iona, kind of a feeling out process, I think Ryder would be the side here. So I saw you in the chat. You brought up a great point about the difference between Gary being booted off Penn State and in this situation. So explain it here to the audience. Yeah, so basically Greg Gordon, <laughs> Kevin brings up my uh, haircut <laughs> post, but it's okay. 700 live viewers, I, I shave it clean. I look like Kevin in the background. Wait, but, um, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that a prop right now? Are we putting the prop <laughs> hit, that 700 viewers hit, equals shaved head for next week? Honestly, we've been riding pretty hot. We hit 600 the other day, so I'm going to say I know no. we did. But, uh, we could get there because I'm going to start pumping that, and we may sit here at like 3 p.m. if that's the case, if you're going to end up with a shaved head out of all of this. But anyway, back to the point about the guy that Iona is is dismissing is the offense is essentially what you were saying in the chat for those that don't see it. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I don't think they're comparable at all. Greg Gordon, the best player on the team uh, by a very far margin. Uh, Clary had been falling off the hill. Like we saw a few bad games in a row. Also, uh, it, like Iona is not a good basketball team. They don't have a second piece. They don't have a third piece. Penn State has Ace Baldwin. Like uh, the, the they lost the best guy, but they give the ball more possessions into a guy who can still shoot a basketball. You take Greg Gordon off this team, uh, your next leading scorer becomes a guy who can only shoot the three ball. So uh, I, I, I don't worry too much. Inevitably, like even the Penn State game, you're always going to, if you can beat the market to an idea, you're always going to take it. Like, yes, Penn State shot well. It's the Ewing theory. Like, Penn State shot well. I, I would assume that they don't do that every time. And again, here, if I own a, if I own a seventh man shoots 10 for 10 from three and I lose by 40 points, which is what my live bet did the other day, um, I, I'm not that worried about it. The chat is alive right now with the talk of 700 live viewers. Can it get there? I don't know if it's going to get there on a Friday that doesn't have a lot of big games, but we'll try. In any event, official play number two is the under in this game, Iona and Ryder, for the reasons that Corby has given over and over again, and again, 7 Eastern time in the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference, which is winding down its regular season here uh, before they begin tournament play championship game in Atlantic City. All right, one more game in this conference, and that is Niagara and Canisius, two schools that are right by each other, Canisius in the downtown Buffalo area. All right, so Canisius, uh, a home dog of one and a half, total 142 and a half, and Kyle has a play. I am curious as to what it is. Another 7 Eastern time game in the MAAC. Thoughts on this one in an official play, Kyle Hunter? 
Yeah, I do like the MAAC. I think this is kind of a fun conference where road teams have usually done pretty well. Um, Niagara is third in the country in a way from home performance rating so far this year, according to Hasla Metrics. They're unbeaten on the road in conference, which is pretty interesting. Um, Canisius has no great home court advantage. This is not a team that's going to, you know, pack up the place and uh, have it rocking or anything. And and TJ, uh, if I mess up this name, I'm sorry, but uh, CM Uish Tindall, uh, the best <laughs> player for for Canisius. Um, he has a concussion. He missed last game. Uh, question mark as to whether he'll play in this game or not. I know they're usually pretty careful with concussions, so I think there's right. a real chance that he'll miss this game. Um, and, you know, why why rush him back for this game when you're having not a great season anyway? Um, Niagara comes into this one playing their best basketball of the season. I think Paulus is a pretty good coach for them. Um, and Canisius has lost seven of their last ten games, and now they might be without their best player. Canisius is first in offensive rebounding in the conference. They kind of rely on that to get second chances because they're not very efficient. Niagara is easily first in the conference in defensive rebounding percentage. So I don't think they'll be able to get what they usually can. Niagara just beat Quinnipiac and Fairfield on the road. Those are the top two teams, or they've been the top two teams in the conference. Uh, Niagara still has a shot to win the conference. It's a big game for them. I'm going to lay the short one and a half points here with the Purple Eagles in this one. All right, I'm going to try the name. It's a it's a Dutch name, Seem Ujendal, I think, Ujendal. Uh, ends in D-A-A-L. Anyway, 14 a game and four rebounds a game, but you, as you're pointing out, he's in concussion protocol. All right, Corby Craig, anything on this one? You did delve into another MAAC game just a moment ago. Anything on this one, including maybe on the total coming up uh, for tonight with Canisius and Niagara, that total at 142 and a half? Oh, of course I got something on this game. The CM guy, um, injury, uh, concussion protocol, Kyle and I were talking about it this morning, but uh, talking to a few guys, he went through shoot-arounds. They were, like, really hesitant to let him play. They play – their next game is next Friday. So uh, it, he is a game-time decision, a true game-time decision. But uh, the guy I was talking to said he would be very surprised if he's on the court. So if he's not on the court, this leans towards an under. Um, the big thing for me here is if you've watched Niagara play basketball – I really like their setup. Their their offense is good. Mensa being out kind of hurts. I'm not sure if he'll be back today, but they have a big man uh, who is the guy that you want to play pick up basketball with. Obioha knows how to set screens. The one of the best screen and roll guys I've seen in the nation. He is seven foot two eighty, and he knows how to use that way. He he's not like a seven foot Filipowski. He's a seven foot like more like a a really bad Shaq. Like he knows how to use his elbows. <laughs> he gets to the rim. Uh, he's shooting from two. 60% from the field, which is and impressive for this low caliber mm-hmm. league to be shooting that well. Uh, he kind of shoot the the deep ball, but it's it, he hasn't shot threes this year. But like he has a little bit of a touch. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, you see some more out of him. But I, I really like him. I have been watching this Niagara team a good bit. I think they slow down the pace to get him the ball uh, in a game where I don't think that uh, Kanishas has anybody really to stop him. And, and Niagara gets the job done overall here. All right, good stuff on this. Again, the play is Kyle's, and his thought is Niagara laying the point and a half. Again, they are regionally close, about 20 miles apart. Niagara, obviously, north of Buffalo up on the Canadian border. So they are playing tonight also at 7 Eastern time. The MAAC, the Ivy League, rolling out a bunch of Friday night games at the same time uh, this evening. So we gave you some good thoughts and discussion on that. I see the live audience growing. I don't know that we're going to get to 700 live viewers, but... We could get to four or 500 live viewers. We're going to do that with your help. Hit the like button. Share the show out. You see we're here at 11 a.m. weekdays. That's why you want to be subscribed because then you need no other reminder. YouTube will give you a prompt that we're about to go live or we are live on the show. And I do see it's always the case uh, within the last 10 minutes of us being here, we've added a couple of hundred viewers uh, already on the show, 150, 200 viewers, something like that. And that number will probably grow here in the back half uh, of what we're doing. Be here at 11 a.m. is the point. We're going to be here all the way through March, all the way through the Final Four. There's a lot of conversation internally that we're going to be here on Saturdays. Stand by for that. A couple of things will dictate that. What's our live audience looking like? Show to show. Also, get that subscriber count up. Uh, Kyle and I were talking about this just before the show began. We're, we're right there at the threshold, Kyle. I keep saying 9,000 subs before March. Hit that subscribe button if you have not done so. It helps us out, uh, builds in more of an audience. It also uh, it promotes through YouTube when you've got more subscribers, and it seems to be a hotter show. So hit that and go. 
here on the program. All right, let's get on to Saturday. We will get to some live Q&A. We're under the belief that everybody wants to know about these games that we're about to talk about on Saturday in particular. It's not going to take long, guys. At noon Eastern time, 11 a.m. local time in Waco, hello, Houston, presumptive number one seed, number one team in the Big 12 at Baylor. Thoughts on this to begin? Kyle Hunter, what do you think that line might be uh, early national TV on CBS Saturday? I see the poll over there. Do you want Saturday shows? Who voted no? I want to know who voted no. <laughs> who like, would what, vote no? Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, um, Houston probably, I mean, Ken Palm has three. I think Houston probably not favored by three points here because Houston has had some trouble um, on the road. Uh, Houston's defense is fantastic. And I think uh, they're a team that I really trust to make a good run because of the defense travels very well, neutral site games. LJ Cryer gets more pub guys, but Jamal Shedd is fantastic. I mean, I think he's the the best go-to player for them, all around best player. Uh, Baylor has slowed down considerably in conference, 19.2 seconds per possession. The Bears' three-point percentage was amazing in non-conference, but only 34.5% uh, in the conference. I think under is the play that I like the best in this one, uh, thinking that this would be a tight, lower scoring game. I don't know what to do with the side. I think maybe Houston minus two or something like that is what we see here. But um, I lean under. Corby Craig, a thought on this. Houston, a midweek win over Iowa State, which we talked about that game. Baylor lost in Provo to BYU in a game they were winning uh, at halftime. But uh, BYU overcame them, hit a bunch of three-point shots. The big guy Khalifa hit like three three three-point shots, a seven-footer for BYU. All right, any thoughts on this, including what the total might be in a lean, Corby? Yeah, so first off, we found the uh, the culprit to betting or hitting the no button. Jason says he tried to hit the yes, and he fat thumbed and accidentally hit the no. <laughs> well, at least so, he owned it. He took the yeah. L. He owned it. Yeah, who doesn't uh, want Saturdays I, from Corby? I respect that. Uh, also, I, I kind of I kind of spoiled this a few weeks back, but let, let me just say, guys, Saturdays are coming. I mean, we haven't announced it yet, but like uh, we have we have set dates. So uh, so just hold your britches. There's what 290, 300 people in here. You get you're the, you'll be the first to know because it's not Good announced. Southern yet, phrase. Hold your britches. Coming. I like that. They're coming. Like they're that. coming. Hold they're your coming. britches. Uh, All right. Uh, can we get back to game, Houston and Baylor, please? Yes. Thank you. Maybe we'll see. We'll see. Uh, this game, I think Houston's probably a four and a half favorite. Houston, the best team in the nation, wow. in my opinion. We already talked about. Uh, Nadu and I have twenty to ones on Baylor, and I feel very. I mean, on Houston, I feel very comfortable with that. The main thing here is I really hope Houston blows Baylor out of the water for a couple reasons. I think I might have said that backwards. I said four and a half Baylor, four and a half Houston. Houston's the better team. Houston will be fair. No, you did. You um, said Houston four and a half, okay, and I said okay, wow. Okay. Uh, I I think if Baylor gets blown out here, you see a BYU loss, a Houston loss, TCU on the road. I would be interested after the TCU, after the Kansas game, they get Texas, Texas Tech. I think you're going to get a really good price to buy Baylor national championship odds. Like I, it wouldn't surprise me if you see a. 45 or a 50 to one um baylor team baylor has an elite player uh rigid dennis is a good player jacoby walters is a good player links in love was hurt for a minute so i don't worry too much jalen bridge is a, a certified first round uh player they i think that they have all the pieces for really good shooters they have all the pieces to make a run in march am i saying they're gonna win uh, probably not but if you see this number four Against Houston, like this is still one of the top ten best teams in the nation. So uh, I think getting a fifty to one, forty five to one after these next two losses, maybe uh, even if it's just after the Houston game, you're going to pick up a good number uh, on Baylor here. All right, interesting for that one again. Eleven a.m. local time for Baylor and Houston. We gave you a lot of good discussion on what might be happening again. Lines, lines will be out later on this afternoon and tonight on Bet US and elsewhere. We'll see what it is, but the guys give you some good insight. All right, as we mentioned, if you're just joining us, Arizona beaten last night by Washington State late night. Simultaneously, a little earlier actually in the evening, it completed, but it still it went to overtime. It was a long game. Washington had a huge lead. Corby Craig led by 25 at one point, had to hang on. The game went to overtime, and they won by two with Arizona State making a great comeback. Um, but Arizona State still comes up short. All right, so now Washington at Arizona. What do we think off the loss this line is going to be, bearing in mind that Arizona was a 12- or 13-point favorite against Washington State? Thoughts, Corby? Yeah, Arizona's interesting. Um, I think any team that tries to run their pace is basically going to get run out, uh, and it seems like that's what's going to happen in this Washington game. Washington 
likes to run pace, 30th in the nation in tempo, and I just don't think they have the talent to keep up with that in an Arizona game, especially uh, on the road, last game, play again uh, in an overtime game, and they go play Arizona. This is just a I, – I know Arizona, Arizona State's not very far of a of a travel situation, but it's still a right. tough spot to play overtime versus an Arizona State team who I don't think is that great. So not to be able to cover that. Also, I had the under in that game, so that's always fun. Uh, overtime, unders, me and TJ can both agree that those are no fun ever. <laughs> uh, shout out Florida, Alabama, but, uh, I yeah, I, I think Arizona, I don't think they're one of the five best teams in the nation, but I do think that they're plenty good to beat a Washington team here. I would imagine this is double digits, probably pretty decent double digits, 12 and a half, 13 seems about right here. Arizona has been repeatedly a double digit favorite, I believe at home, uh, Kyle, a thought that it is a noon local game to Eastern time and Arizona at an advantage because they're sitting at home and Washington is the road team. Having played Arizona state, they had to travel or whether they, whether they did it overnight. They, I don't, they probably bust from Tempe to Tucson. I'm just saying that you can get there just as quick as going and sitting in an airport, flying on a private plane and then blah, blah, blah. So th- I don't know if they did bust or not. But you got to turn right back around and play at noon on the body clock on Saturday. And any thought on what the total would be here, Washington and Arizona? Total like 165, 164 wow. now, somewhere in the mid 160s. I think Arizona wins this one going away would be would be my thought. Uh, they're probably favored by 15, uh, somewhere in that range. And I mean, Washington is a bad they don't match up well with Arizona. They can't do the same thing Washington State did. Washington State was very smart, slowed the game down, um, very deliberate on offense. They played at their pace. Big bodies, big bodies too, right, for Washington State that Washington does not have. Yeah, they don't have that same. um, They they also don't use their bench much. So the fact that they just went to overtime late Thursday night, not a great sign. They played 82 possessions in that game that went to overtime. I think this is a great spot for Arizona. So I'm curious what this line comes out at. Um, I would definitely look toward betting Arizona in this game. Probably a good spot for them to kind of prove a point. I'm just double checking here and you guys may have all the info. I don't know what I know in the UCLA game. They were like a 15 point or more favorite and UCLA was up by 15 or 18 and easily covered. Uh, Arizona won the game, but they didn't even win by double figures in that one. And I don't know what the lines were. You guys may have it in front of you on Cal and Stanford. Stanford um, ended up being an 11 point margin. Cal ended up being a 16 point margin Were those two covers recently at home. You guys would probably have that for Arizona. And obviously, this was not a cover. It's an outright loss to Washington State last night to throw that in the mix. Anything on that, guys, on recent trend for Arizona as a home favorite and covering? I'm assuming they covered Cal. I don't even know the number, but they won by what it looks like, 26, 25. Right. Uh, My math. Yeah, 26. You're correct. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. I was going to say it. Uh, (laughs) uh, Stanford, I don't know. I would assume it was probably close. I don't have the number in front of me, but uh, an 11 point win on the road versus Stanford team is pretty feisty. It's not a bad look. All right. Again, this one will be at noon. It's part of that triple header that CBS has. It begins with the Houston Baylor game. We're talking about the second of those two games at 2 Eastern time, noon Mountain time, and that is Washington and Arizona. The third of those games right in a row is Alabama at Kentucky. I I thought Kentucky had solved their problems on defense. And then LSU uh, treated them like a revolving door for a lot of that second half, scoring on them, coming from behind. Here's another comeback, 16-point comeback by LSU. Now back on Wednesday night against Kentucky. Kentucky back home with Alabama. Overtime game, wild game with Florida also on Wednesday night. All right, thoughts on what this line will likely open at? Corby Craig, a thought and some handicapping on on Alabama, Kentucky. Uh, Bama two and a half, maybe Bama three and a half. And uh, wow. hold the, called my shot with uh, Florida a few weeks back, beating Auburn by a good bit in a spot that Florida's going to be a dog. Calling it again. I think Kentucky wins this game. Uh, wins this game by uh, three, four, or five points. It's a Kentucky team who, again, we've talked about the talent all the time. Uh, Bama, I've talked about their lack of talent. I, I still think that they're overachieving for their talent basis. On the road, uh, last time Alabama played, we kind of talked about this. Bama shooting 10% worse on the road than at home from deep, um, and that is their whole game. So can Kentucky guard anybody? As always, that's the question. Uh, but I do think that they have the talent to at least keep up, which Alabama defensively, I, I don't know if they can stop anybody either. So this is going to be a, uh, 
400 point game, all star game, which <laughs> I think Kentucky has a chance to win. We talked the other night. You were on the show. 174 was the total when, that we were discussing, or 174 and a half. Very interesting if it will be similar to that. Kyle Hunter, Alabama is the first SEC team since 1974. Hello, pre three point shot, pre uh, shot clock to score 90 or more in three consecutive SEC games. That's what Alabama has done. They are the first team in eight seasons to have seven games in a row with 80 or more Alabama. So the wisdom, the thought is they're going to get 80 points in this game. What about a thought on the total here? Alabama at Kentucky Saturday afternoon. I mean, what is this total going to be? I see Bart Torvik has this one, 183. Um, wow. Ken Palm has 178. I think probably 179 or so is probably what this total is. I feel terrible for saying this, but I think I lean the under in this game. I mean, 179 is kind of crazy. Don't do it. I fell I into know, the I trap probably, with the live button earlier in the week. Don't do well, it. No, I'm not going to. I'm probably not going to bet this game. But if I if I had to bet the total, I'd probably bet the under. Kentucky has been a little bit better defensively. And these things are all relative, obviously. But um uh Thiero, i believe is his name the, the mm-hmm. bigger guy that's come in and, and played some pretty good defense um they, they've had several changes to their roster that i think they are a decent amount better on defense the other thing is look at the pace they played against auburn 67 possessions two teams that are usually you know 73 74 possessions i think kentucky was the team that slowed that game down and then against lsu 71 not terribly fast for against another team that plays really fast so i'm not sure 75 possessions like uh, Ken Palm projects here is definite because I think Kentucky might try to slow it down a little bit versus Bama. I know Bama doesn't slow it down against anybody. Um, I would lean Kentucky too, thinking, uh, you know, if you get plus two, two and a half, three, somewhere in that range, Kentucky could be a pretty good dog in this one because Alabama has been riding high. They were really fortunate to win that Florida game. And now they go on the road against a Kentucky team that's coming off a really tough way to lose in that last game. I think it's a pretty good spot for them. Yeah, as uh, as much as Alabama was euphoric about how they won and won the game in overtime, Kentucky had the winning shot, it looked like, from Dillingham, uh, Kenny Dillingham, only to have LSU come down on a broken play and get the putback with no time left to beat them. Um, by the way, the SEC did find LSU a hundred grand right out of, right out of the box. Matter of fact, and warned them again, it'll be two hundred fifty thousand the next time that people are running on the court in an SEC game. Uh, for them, uh, that's a new conference policy they have for football and basketball. Uh, Corby, there's a lot of there's a lot of talk in the in the chat here that you would still look strongly at an over in this game, even if it is like one seventy eight, one seventy nine. Final thought on if it's that high of a total, what's the handicap? I think it's I think it opens 176 and a half. That's kind of the number that these really massive ones have just opened. Um, and then if they see move either way, they'll they'll drop it up or down. I, I think it opened 176 and a half. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it hops three points at open over or under 172 or 177 uh, are two good spots for it to sit, in my opinion. I would lean towards the under. I fully agree. I think first off, Alabama on the road shoots awful. We've kind of talked about this already. Possessions might be there. You might see it, but uh, overall. I think Kentucky has the guards to stand in front of Alabama guards, not foul as much. The game that is most comparable to, in my opinion, is like the Creighton-Alabama game when when Bama went on the road, played Creighton in an 82 or 85-82 game, which, Mm -hmm. as crazy as it sounds, still goes under. Uh, Creighton shot 29 free throws in that game. I don't think Bama's defense is as bad as they were at that time. I don't know if Kentucky's good enough at driving to the rim. Uh, I, I think this, I mean... This is 177. I, I would make this number closer. I don't have my number in front of me, but I would be closer to like 170 flat, 169 probably, and uh, would wow. be forcing under pretty heavy here. Again, for Alabama, 98 in the Florida overtime game, 100 in a regulation game with Texas A&M, 109 in the regulation game at LSU. This is what they've been doing as of late. And you referenced, uh, Kyle, just one more time, the Auburn game last Saturday night. Auburn began that game 2 of 20 from three-point range at home. All right, Alabama the other night began the Florida game 1 for their first 17 in the first half before they started making a couple late in the first half. So will there be some bricks against Kentucky's defense? And at Rupp Arena, we'll see. Now, the one thing is Alabama can ignite. We know this. They had one stretch against Florida where they hit four three-pointers in literally like a minute 
forty of clock time. So it can happen quickly with the way they play. So let's see what happens. We gave you a lot of conversation for Eastern time in that triple header for Alabama, Kentucky. One more game for us to discuss, and that is SMU coming into Tampa, where I am. South Florida, the leading team in the American Conference at 13-1. and one. This is a Sunday game, kids, so we look forward to seeing what Amir Abdul-Rahim's team can do uh, off of a, a shaky performance at Texas San Antonio. No other way to describe it. Bad UTSA team. South Florida had to come from behind and beat them in the final three minutes. Did not cover. All right. SMU on Thursday night beaten at Boca Raton by Florida Atlantic. Boca Raton over in the eastern part of the state, just north of Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Now they'll come uh, to the west central part of the state, three hours across, stay in Florida and play this game on Sunday. What do we think, Kyle, this will open at for USF? Likely a home favorite. What do you make? What do you think the line is going to be here in uh, in Tampa? I think they're going to be favored here. Um, SMU minus one. Something like that. You don't think I mean, USF's even like a short two-point favorite here, even off the loss for SMU? Art Torvik has SMU minus two and a half, and Ken Palm has SMU minus three. I think that's too much, but I don't think USF will be favored. Um, probably SMU minus one or so. Having said that, uh, TJ, I think it was pretty good win for South Florida. I know they didn't play well against UTSA, but that was about as bad a spot as you could get. I mean, you have come off that massive home game against Florida mm-hmm. Atlantic. If you just win that game, I think you should be fine with it. So um, good good comeback at the end to win that game. Um, lean toward an under in this game, thinking that uh, South Florida's defense has really improved a lot through the year. Uh, we knew that they'd be pretty good offensively. They brought in some of those guys from Kennesaw. Youngblood's been very good. Uh, but I think their defense has impressed me the most because, you know, if you look in the conference, they're first in defensive efficiency in the conference. Pretty surprising. Um, SMU is also a good defense. They're ninth in the country in effective field goal percentage defense. Mm. Uh, I think this is a good game. I, I don't know that I'm excited to bet this game. I'm excited to watch it for sure, though. Again, for SMU, and we see everybody in the chat going back and forth about SMU. They'd won six in a row, and they pasted my Memphis Tigers scoring over 100 points back on Sunday. They were in the game, Corby, Thursday night with Florida Atlantic, but Florida Atlantic just outplayed them. Victor Golden was tremendous down low. All right, a thought on this Sunday early. uh, Again, the amazing story of South Florida almost out of nowhere. They can be 14-1 and in the American Conference if they win this. What do you think also the total might be here, Corby? Yeah, I think SMU is the better team, uh, but I, I do think the market kind of is giving South Florida some love. We saw that weird five and a half the other day uh, that they didn't cover. That's the only reason I think SMU might be a favorite uh, market kind of regressing towards this idea that maybe South Florida has gotten a little lucky. But overall, Chris Youngblood, such a talented scorer. Inevitably, he's going to run into a, a team that can try to shut him down. Obviously, he's not going to get stopped. He shoots 43% from three, and he's done it for three years at this point. He is a great basketball player. Uh, South Florida, great story. They have all the pieces. In my opinion, this is an under or nothing. Uh, we talked about it the last show. South Florida is a really good defense. I, I think they get praised for the scoring they've been able to do and the upsets that they've been able to force, but uh, their defense, I mean, they've shot lights out. They're going to regress shooting. It's going to happen. Unfortunately, you just can't shoot like that. But their defense will not regress. Their defense has looked good time over time. SMU's defense, great. They lost to Florida Atlantic, but uh, they just didn't have size. Like Florida Atlantic has the pieces. They kind of shut down the guards for most of the game. Golden is just, like, he was getting fouled every single play. It was a foul every single play. I watched the game. Um, they just don't have anybody that's that size, and I, I don't think they have that issue here. So an under, I think this opens probably 144.5. National average, 140. So which shade towards an under? I hope it's a little higher than that, and uh, I can bet an under here. I will be there at the Yingling Center to see this again. Again, full disclosure, uh, I was the play-by-play voice for the South Florida Bulls for 10 seasons, 1997 to 07. Shout out again to my man, Jim Lighthall, who has continued on 17 more years. He was with me for 10 years. He's been there 27 years. In that time, South Florida has been in the NCAA tournament once in 2012. They are in range. If they get a win here, it's a top 40 win right now in the net. If they get a win here, they would be in range uh, for the at-large consideration. And let's see what happens. It is interesting that Florida Atlantic was favored by five and a half or six last week, and that game was no contest for a lot of the game. 
uh, uh, last week with all the emotion. What will it be like Sunday? We will see. We gave you some good discussion on that. With that, we've covered a lot of games, including Saturday and Sunday. We can circle back. To Friday, you see uh, that we are here live at 11 a.m. for the interaction. We're going to get to some of your questions. We can circle back to Friday or maybe a game or two that we haven't talked about yet. Again, a lot of you have joined us. Over 100 more have joined us like in the last 10 minutes. You see on the slate there on the screen what we've already talked about. You can go back and rewatch the thoughts on those different games, especially the Saturday games, uh, if you're curious. So let's get into some questions while we have some time, guys. Uh, Elias is watching. Watching us live on a Friday says thoughts on Youngstown State laying three and a half with Milwaukee and a total of 162 and a half Horizon League action late in the Horizon League season here. Uh, any thought on this from either of you side or total Kyle I saw the nod. Thought about picking Milwaukee here. This was one of my uh, considerations for, for the show today. Um, I think Milwaukee is better than a lot of people think, and I think Lundy is a really good coach who has made this team improve throughout the course of the season. Youngstown State, though, is is pretty tough team. Uh, in the end, I decided to pass on this one. You know, Friday slate is a pretty difficult one, obviously, so it's great that we get to talk about Saturday. But um, Milwaukee winning this game would not surprise me at all. So definitely my lean here is Milwaukee plus the points. Youngstown State 11 and 6 late in the Horizon uh, season, if I have that right. Yes, Milwaukee 9 and 7. So actually, uh, Youngstown State has a game in hand uh, right now, chasing Oakland at the top of the conference, who's 14 and 4 in the Horizon League. Corby Craig, a thought on the Milwaukee Panthers hosting this game. They have won back to back games with Cleveland State and Northern Kentucky. Any thought, including the total, real quick? Yeah, this number makes sense. Um, I, I, the thing is, like, Milwaukee's 260th in the nation for Ken Palm. So if you just look at, like, a flat uh, stat sheet of what team is better, it's it's definitely Youngstown State. But uh, Milwaukee is making the right strides towards the direction of being good. I mean, this is a team last year who looked good, but two years ago was 10-22. and 22. So I think uh, the, the more they can regress away from what they were in 2022, which was a Pat Baldwin father-son basketball team, uh, the, the more sample size you can get through of that, the, the better they're going to be. Uh, Youngstown State dogs, like we've seen them for years, be a pretty good mid-major team in like the 100 range. Not a team that I want to fade by any means. Probably would lean towards an over. The, both of these teams are, are going to try to push an electric pace. So I uh, laid completely away from this game. I actually didn't even know they played today is how quickly I scanned over this game. Um, but it, it was not part of Ivy talent. League. It was not part of Ivy League Friday. <laughs> Ivy League Friday, so just... DJ, come on. Brown, you. Yes. I mean, Brown, uh, By the Brown way, you Columbia. said dogs. We know that Youngstown State's the Penguins, my friend. Let's see That's what true. the they Penguins have, the, have tonight. One of the coolest the Milwaukee logos Penguins. in the nation. Yeah, we'll see what they have for this tonight. Uh, PW is watching us, a member, and says, guys, question on Kent State. He's interested in the team total over 65. This is the game with Akron. Kent State at Akron. Thoughts, Kyle? I know uh, you love the Maction. You're in Ohio. Any thought on that team total? I don't know. I'm getting pixelated here, so uh, I'm getting a little worried. Uh, we do hear you. Out. We do hear you. Give a quick thought, and I don't know if you had to jump out of the call and come back in, but give a quick yeah, thought on Kent State team total. Right back. Um, you know, I think Akron will win this game. This is a really hotly contested game, always a, a rivalry type game. I, I don't have any strong opinion on this one, so I'm going to let Corby <laughs> talk and then hope I can come back in okay. and look better than this. He will, he will disappear. It's like he's in the witness protection program and we're trying to hide his identity. So he will disappear for a second. Corby thought just real quick here on Kent State and that game with Akron. Akron, one of the better teams in the MAC. Any quick thought, Corby? Yeah, the these like notions of um buying low or buying into rivalry games have kind of been burned at this point like we see too much move we saw uh i think there was a game we were talking about the other day that god who was it me and matt cox were talking about it but the game was lined seven we both said it probably should have been four and a half they were gonna win uh, and they ended up winning by four so uh this is a game similar i, I think there's too much notion into this rivalry and, and the prices are getting pushed too hard i think akron's by far the better team um you're getting a number soft because you think that this game is going to be a slug fight. Also, I, I think the over is a play here. When Mark says it's back down to 135 and a half, which is mm. sketchy because the move at 1040 in the morning, which is weird. Uh, I'll have to look into that. But uh, I do think that this is a game that plays towards the over more often than not. 
All right, we'll quickly go. Kyle's back with us. Good to see you back, Kyle. Uh, Akron off the loss to Toledo, by the way, still chasing Toledo 11-2 and two in the MAC. Six Eastern time tonight in the Rhodes Arena on CBS Sports Network for that one. Time for a couple more quick questions, Friday, Saturday, et cetera. Celeste TC says, thoughts on Indiana and Penn State. Have they given up on Mike Woodson? They were beaten badly by Nebraska decisively the other night at home. Now Indiana at Penn State off of that win. Thoughts on what that number would be or a little handicapping? Either of you, any thought? State minus four and a half, five, somewhere in that range. And I, this, would, this would not be at the top of my list of games I, won't, I would want to bet because Penn State kind of went in a bad spot coming off that uh, thrilling comeback win. Yep. But I'm not betting Indiana, so it's either Penn State or pass. Corby, kind of same thing. Any interest in this or stay away? I'm not sure if I'm hearing Corby. Did we lose him on the audio? He is muted. muted. Go ahead. Take two. Any thought on Indiana, Penn State, or does the mute button maybe symbolize who cares on that? I got too much uh, Diet Coke in me, so I'm struggling. All right. Uh, Yeah, the biggest thing is I, I think at some point you can buy low on an Indiana team who does have talent, and I, I still inevitably think that Mike Woodson isn't an awful coach. The issue is we're running out of games here. Like, <laughs> right. you're not going to be able to keep buying. Like, you can buy low until the until the season ends, and then and then you're done. So, I'm not sure. But I think Penn it's a, the place I want to buy it. It's a va- it's a valid question. Do they show anything, Indiana? Because they didn't show anything midweek at home with Nebraska, and Penn State's got to feel good about themselves. But like uh, Kyle was saying. That dramatic of a comeback, do you have a little letdown? These are college kids. Do you have a letdown? Maybe it, maybe it happens quickly. Joe watching. He's a new member. Thank you, Joe. Says, Kyle, what are your thoughts on K-State and BYU? K-State lost the last time they played. Is this a revenge game? Quick thought. Kyle? I would lean Kansas State here in this game. Uh, BYU, 355th and away from home performance, according to Haslam Metrics. Obviously, they're great at home. Um, they haven't been very good on the road. BYU's defense in the conference has been really bad. 1.1 points per play allowed in Big 12. I think BYU pushes the pace enough here that I lean toward an over as well, but I think Kansas State plus the points is definitely my lean in that one. Love it. Corby, we got a question for you. Cole watching says he's a new member. Greensboro Mercer for Saturday. He's interested in the over. Any thought on that? Corby. Cool. I'm glad that that's the question because I was I was worried it was going to be too too generic of a question. But Greensboro is my team, TJ. Uh, I've talked about Greensboro a million times. So Greensboro, I've, first I've off, lost track of how many my teams you have. Go on, Greensboro, go. Four of them: High Point, Greensboro, Winthrop, UAB. Uh, okay. So when, Greensboro is going to be a slow team. You're going to get a total. I would almost exactly say it's going to be 136 and a half. That's the number that they open every Greensboro game. Uh, it's an over bet or nothing. Greensboro, 319th in the nation in tempo, but that's not true. Uh, they have a very good ISO player in Michael Brown Jones. The second he touches the ball, double teams are coming. He doesn't want to double team, so he instantly makes his move to the basket as fast as he can. So this is basically a question of can they get him the ball and can he beat double teams? And if he doesn't, he's getting fouled. Uh, so 319th in the nation, tempo just isn't true. Mercer can't play defense. They've learned how to score a little bit. Over 136 and a half, I will be betting that almost certainly tomorrow. All right, good stuff. Quickly, Mark watching, get his question in. He's asking about Nevada tonight, laying 10 with San Jose State. Very rugged Mountain West, San Jose State, not very good. Any thoughts? It's a large lay there, double figures. Anything? Seems this like a game lot. Where... Go ahead, go ahead, Corby. What's, uh, does anybody, do you have the total, Kyle? Um, I'll, I'll this, find it. This, go ahead. Well, this is a game, 140s. Yeah, so this is a game, like, Points seem like a lot. San Jose State played some decent defense. Uh, Nevada, like, I, I think they have two, three good scorers. But uh, overall, I, I'm just not confident that this is a team who, first, competent defenses can can lay the double digits and win outright. Nevada has an at-large case. Do not need to find the coffee table in the middle of the night, as we like to talk about here at San Jose State. They've won five of their last six. I was looking. They have not played correct so this is not a no they have played is, and nevada won the first game by 30 kyle any quick thought this is the game where um nevada was winning 67 to 24 at one point before mm. they let mm. up so if a team has any pride you would think they'd show up in this game if san jose state uh, lays down and plays really badly here they're probably a good fade the rest of the season um so i think i'd rather just wait and see here and look uh, look uh, to see what it means for the future 
and I can't get out of here without asking it. Memphis FAU, FAU off the win over SMU, Florida Atlantic, now goes to Memphis, first of two meetings. Florida Atlantic probably still going to be like a four or five point favorite because Memphis has been so bad on Memphis's home floor. You guys agree with that for Sunday, Sunday afternoon? I would say three and a half. I think that's a a good breakdown by you. I thought you were going to shoot that number really high because Memphis has looked bad. But I think Memphis inevitably still does have talent. Uh, We have to see. I mean, they played really good for Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte played slow and it played right into Memphis's hands, did it not? I mean, I mean, Florida Atlantic's not going to play that slow. So, and Memphis cannot guard. We keep saying that. Kyle, any quick thought on that? Florida Atlantic, Memphis Sunday, and then we get out of here. I mean, um, Memphis dominated the boards against Charlotte. You know, do we think they can do that again in this game? Probably not. I think Florida Atlantic, uh, if they're three or less, would be my lean in this game. But I, I think it might be a little bigger. All right. Fascinating. Fascinating stuff uh, across the board. A lot of great discussion. Let's look at what the guys are officially on for Friday. Uh, they are on two or actually three different plays. Kyle has a side with Niagara in the game with Canisius. It's Ivy League Friday, kids. Corby's going brown, getting three and a half with Columbia, and he takes an under in the MAAC game with Iona and Ryder, and we gave you a lot of conversation about Saturday and Sunday. Buckle up, kids. It's going to be a lot of fun heading into March. Uh, We are here Monday through Friday. Final thoughts, Corby, final thoughts? Yeah, uh, there's a lot lot of good games this weekend. Be watching out. Talked about this on Monday, but um, double-check your injury sources. There's a few good guys on Twitter that um, there's going to be a lot of injuries pop up this weekend. You'll see some guys who are quote-unquote sick, who just don't want to play because their team has fallen apart. Shout out uh, Indiana. So these type of teams, I, I think you're going to find some spots where uh, key players just so happen to miss because uh, they got sick. Teams that don't want to play like Louisville scoring, we didn't get on you for this, scoring 50 points the other night. I know they had injuries Two against Notre Dame at home. I know, but... Are you ready to concede they're bad yet, or do we have to keep beating you up? They're a two-point uh, favorite Kyle, with other two best players. Kyle, uh, and they lost by how much? Kyle, uh, final thought. Um, yeah, I wanted to shout out Trevor, who's in the chat like every day. I think um, he he said we should mention that Green Bay is still pretty good too. We we don't want to overlook yes. Green Bay, uh, a man of the people here. So uh, shout out to him for that. Uh, Green Bay has had a really good season, and enjoy the weekend, everybody. A lot of great games, and uh, those Saturday shows are coming, I believe. Should be a lot of fun, guys. Thank you. We thank everybody for watching. Uh, Kevin, everybody behind the scenes at BetUS TV. We're back next week starting at 11 a.m. on BetUS TV. Thanks for joining in. Don't forget to like our video. If you don't want to miss our next show, make sure to ring our bell and subscribe. For all our sports content, head to BetUSTV.com. See you next time.